Hi, and welcome to yet another philosophical improvisation. Today, a bit different, a bit longer. Um, I am going to go through the draft of a presentation for a talk I will give tomorrow at uh, a um, philosophy and psychoanalysis conference on the concept of truth. So my talk is about the truth of capitalism and um, I will go quickly through the slides. This is based on a book I wrote in 2008 called Peut-on jouir du capitalisme? Lacan avec Marx et Heidegger. That book is actually being translated into Swedish. So, first of all, we must uh, summarize what is going on in the capitalist sphere. Uh, capitalism is about surplus value and purchase. Surplus value means that sales revenue less the cost of production should produce a financial benefit. It's a very simple basic definition. So I'm not trying here to uh, define capitalism in a technical sense. I'm trying to define it logically and psychologically. So in order for this process uh, of uh, production of surplus value to function, we need uh, at the same time to um, acknowledge that there is a production of a virtuality and abstraction, namely capital. That virtuality is considered valuable because it represents a universal possibility of purchase and or power. What we observe in the last hundred years is that for capitalism to function, there needs to be a continuous extension of the territory of purchasable objects. Okay, so to give an example, we could imagine a uh, society where access to unpolluted oxygen becomes a necessity and a necessity that would be accessible only to those who can afford it. The other ones would uh, die of uh, all sorts of diseases provoked by pollution. This is already the case. There are uh, tens of um, thousands of deaths in cities provoked by the pollution of the atmosphere, pollution of the air. And uh, people need to live in those cities in order to work. Okay, so anticipated capital is a virtuality with a factual causation and impact on reality. It is an abstraction, capital is an abstraction, ever projected in the future. Nevertheless, that uh, fiction has real impact on reality. Okay, so the capitalist fear is what Lacan calls the discourse of the master, okay? So by discourse uh, is meant a system, a system of uh, exchange of symbols and other commodities. Now let's look at the emotional sphere. What if the emotional sphere functioned as in an analogon of uh, the capitalist sphere? Okay, so in this case we could say that the emotional sphere means experiential benefit that should produce an emotional enjoyment once you take away the existential cost. So here again you would have the production of a virtuality, an abstraction, uh, Lacan calls it jouissance, absolute enjoyment, happiness. That virtuality is considered valuable because it represents a universal possibility of happiness and, again, and power. Um, 
we could argue that in this case, a, an emotional sphere that would function as um, a projection of the capitalist sphere would imply a continuous extension of the domain of pleasure. And this is arguably the case today, where people um, believe that uh, school should be a pleasurable, um, work should be pleasurable, uh, human relations should be pleasurable. Uh, I mean, we're not saying here that uh, they, they should be a horrible experience, right? But um, it is not certain that uh, the um, paradigm of enjoyment can be universalized to the entire sphere of experience. And it is not certain that this actually produces more happiness. So there is a contradiction, of course, uh, in its logic that in the end, uh, it produces the opposite. Okay, now let's consider a third sphere, the sphere of knowledge, the epistemic sphere, the sphere of truth. If it is the case that today that sphere is, um, and Lacan calls it the discourse of the university, uh, while the emotional uh, sphere is the discourse of the hysterical for Lacan. If the epistemic sphere was a translation, a transposition of the economic sphere, We could say that cognitive outcome less the cost of research or search or quest should produce an epistemic benefit, an effect of truth. And here again we have the production of virtuality, namely knowledge. And uh, at the very limit, this idea of omniscience, which is so present today uh, in our um, society ruled by artificial intelligence and a desire to forecast the um, future and the behaviors um, with uh, accuracy and precision in order to control uh, the future. The future being therefore um, um, part of that extension of domain of the purchasable. We want to sell the future. That virtuality, namely absolute knowledge, is considered valuable because it represents a universal possibility of understanding and again of power. And this supposes a continuous extension of the domain of the knowable. And in other words, what is it? It is science, modern science. Modern science is the capitalist equivalent of the idea that we can sell everything, we can know everything, we can measure everything. There is a science of poetry, for example, or there should be a science of human emotions, a science of social behavior, a science of God. So in this case, anticipated knowledge is a virtuality which has an effectual causation and impact on reality yet again. And it's very easy to see how um, anticipations of knowledge uh, have a, an immediate impact on the present. See, for example, the amounts of uh, money and, and millions that are spent uh, in programs that are uh, emulating the brain, that are mimicking uh, the brain um, and its connections uh, in uh, computers as if uh, we could uh, produce intelligence just by looking at uh, chemical uh, transactions between uh, neurons. And in a way it does produce intelligence and that's why it's never ending produces a form of intelligence that is relative, not in the machine itself, but in the discourse of 
uh, the university. And that's keeping the machine running um, as much as emotions are kept running with the fiction of absolute enjoyment, as much as uh, capitalism is kept running by the fiction of continuous uh, surplus value. Okay, so if we summarize, anticipated capital is a virtuality with a factual causation and impact on the present. So is anticipated enjoyment, absolute enjoyment, jouissance. And so it is, so is anticipated knowledge. So we have three fictions, three horizons, three absolutes, three ideals that are arguably never attainable, which nevertheless produce many effects on the present. We could say that those are three fetishizations of the future. The paradox here is that we are anticipating an impossibility. We are anticipating an infinite. Mm, and there is this idea, it's called the infinite monkeys theorem. That, well, eventually, in the long term, uh, anything that can happen will happen. In fact, not even anything that can happen, anything at all will happen if we wait an infinite amount of time. And that's how our brain, our desire, our emotions function. Because in fact, this idea of the infinite is embedded in the world. It's not just a logical fiction. It is embedded in our um, behavior. There are two infinites. There is the, uh, and we, there is a confusion between these two infinites. There is the infinite that is purely incremental. We um, make an addition, one plus one plus one plus one, okay? So that's the numerical infinite. But then there is the absolute infinite, and there's this idea that, well, infinity produces uh, the emergence of novelty. So now uh, the title of the paper was the truth of capitalism, right? So what is meant by that? And what is meant by everything that was said until now? Well, I believe that we can say that the truth of capitalism is summarized in a three word slogan. More is less, okay? Not less is more, but more is less. And that is, that has another name and it's called overproduction. The main problem of the capitalist sphere, the emotional sphere and the epistemic sphere is overproduction, right? Because there is this gap that we need to fill, gap of knowledge, knowledge gap we say in research, um, emotional gap, need of love, affection, um, enjoyment, pleasure. And, of course, the uh, capital gap, right, which is always uh, generated by um, our everyday life, where uh, more and more things are uh, commodities. There's the gap of not having enough money, but there's also the gap of having too much money. A lot of people don't know what to do uh, with more than a reasonable amount of money. They need to spend it. Uh, and of course they don't know how to spend it because it never really satisfies that gap they have in them, which is essentially the same gap. The epistemic gap, the emotional gap, and the um, capitalist gap are the idea of the infinite within us, not the relative infinite, but the absolute infinite. Right? This idea of absolute possibility can generate two modes of understanding. One based on lack, based on the idea that the earth is but a rock 
and that we need to overproduce to maintain life on it. And an opposite idea would be, well, absolute possibility is not way back there in the future, unreachable, uh, but in fact all around us as abundance, not necessarily visible abundance, not necessarily material abundance, not necessarily epistemic abundance, but in fact as a, a feeling, an emotion. And that's what I call creation of the creo. It is the imminent feeling that the world is absolute generosity. Um, the idea that we don't need to produce constantly in order to uh, receive. Okay, so a paradigm of lack can only create overproduction. We always go too far and then fall back where we started. We need a paradigm and a shared cosmology of abundance, not the real as void and desire as lack, but rather the creel as infinite, present, imminent abundance. And that might be a scandal for some, right? For um, well-intentioned people might say, look at the poor people in Africa. How can you speak of abundance? Well, precisely. Uh, if they're really concerned about the people in Africa, they should go to Africa and really help them. Uh, they are only concerned about those people in discourse and, and they reproduce the capitalist mode of lack, which only uh, creates that idea that those who do not have do not possess access to uh, the three um, modes uh, of um, a capitalist fear are considered inferior. So my idea is, of course, that we need to shift from a paradigm of more is less, right, which is the truth of capitalism, the more we produce, the less, in fact, we have, the less we experience, the less we feel this uh, emotional gratitude that in the end everybody pretends to follow and to aspire to. And less is more, which is um, a well-known slogan and then which actually is a slogan that um, is sometimes present even uh, in production modes. My point in using here the slogan less is more is a reference to a 19th century poem right? so it's it's not a reference to uh, the so-called marketing of authenticity which uh, might be um, relying on a mode of production that seems much more authentic and, and, and simple and respectful but in in the end it is still it, it's interesting there are interesting um, initiatives there but it is still dependent of the necessity of overproduction right and just look at the supermarkets how um, bio food is now overproduced and so now we need something else we need gluten-free and after gluten-free we'll invent something else um, okay so let me finish with a reading no I won't I won't read the uh, poet poem by uh, Robert Browning uh, less is more the, the title of the poem is Andrea del Sarto just these two lines perhaps to paint a little thing like you smeared carelessly passing with your robes afloat. You do much less, so much less, someone says. I know his name, no matter, so much less. Well, less is more. 
Lucretia, and I am judged. And of course, we know many experiences or occurrences in life where less is more. That was called the soul, well, not so long ago. Okay, so I will leave you with this um, unfinished note that I still have until tomorrow to um, elaborate this uh, more logically, uh, but I wanted to um, practice the talk uh, in uh, sharing with you and see you tomorrow.